All right, we are here with Tommy Williams in Lyons, Georgia, one of the pioneers of the olive business in Georgia. Tommy, show us what you got here. So this is some, where we mill our olives, and the most important thing about good olive oil is to mill it the day you pick it. And if not, you need to put it in cold storage for at 34 degrees until you can mill it. But lots of bad oil happens because they don't mill it soon enough. So this is wh where we mill. The olives are run through a water bath and a, a, a blower that blows all the sticks and leaves and things like that out. And then we put the olives in this hopper here. And um, uh, the olives, are we typically harvest them when they're about half turned. So there'll be some green, some dark, and some sort of purplish. And uh, the olives go through here, then they go through these, uh, this series of knives that cut the olives and cut the pits as well. And it chops it, pushes it through this um, uh, grid, and then it falls down into this what looks like an ice cream churn. And it kind of works like an ice cream churn. Just slowly for about 45 minutes, this apparatus turns and um, starts the separation from the oil from the paste. You begin to see a little uh, oil float on the top. You know, oil floats on, on water, so it'll float on the top. You can see it glistening, and then you know it's time to start the separation. Now, <clears throat> olive oil's been separated from water for thousands of years, and it, we've gotten better in the modern age. You know, it was done by just an oxen and a in stone, just crushing the olives and letting the olive oil run out a trench, and then putting it in a in a clay pot where it would all the dregs would grow through the bottom and the oil would stay on the top, and that's how olive oil was was processed for thousands of years. Uh, then they got a hydraulic press or a screw type press that would just push the olives, the oil out of out of the olives through a um, a mesh of, of like cheesecloth or something of that nature. And then finally they came up with a centrifuge that put the olive oil and the paste in in a uh, in a apparatus that turned about this one actually turns about 3,000. Show, 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 show us that. Yeah, sure. So the olive oil at the paste after it's relaxed for 45 minutes is pushed up into here and it goes into this tube. And as you know, uh, the centrifugal force will push all the heavy material to the outside and the lighter material will form on a column on the inside. The heavier material, material is the paste and the water, and the light is the olive. So there'll be a column of olive oil, and these little orifices, which are attached to a, a, a stainless steel pipe, go down to where that separation takes place and the oil is able to come out of those orifices. Then all the waste material pushes on down, comes out these holes, and is pumped out to the outside. Now, for hundreds of years, there's not been a solution for what to do with the paste after you get the olive oil out. It's very bitter. Most animals don't like it, so it's, and it's got pits in it, so you gotta deal with that. Uh, most people through the ages have just put it back on the land, and that's what I've done. Fertilizer. But they have discovered that you could cook the olive oil, make and dry it, make pellets out of it, and feed it to cows. And it's become all, almost the same as Wagyu beef. Wow. So we're looking into that. It's probably a complicated, expensive process, but uh, we produced about 40 tons of waste this year that we possibly could make some money on. All right, I would like to look at your finished product okay. now. Once the olive oil comes out of the, um, the centrifuge, uh, we take it because it's going to have a little waste in it. It's going to be a little bit of paste in the oil, so we have to clean that up. You can clean it up by just letting it settle out or you can clean it up with a filter. The filter, it costs more to do that, but it gets it really clean and you don't have problems in the future with your oil getting a 
rank uh, smell or taste. So we put it in stainless steel containers, and these stainless steel containers have a floating lid. So whatever level the oil is at is where the lid's going to be, and the, around the lid is an inner tube. You pump up that inner tube to keep any air from getting to the oil. Now you can use some food grade nitrogen as well that will displace that uh, option or whatever is left there. And then you tap that out. My, this is kind of a family operation, so my children, my daughter's at college now, but uh, I get them in here and it's almost like forced labor even though I do pay them. <laughs> but, but they're learning to work, which is the most important thing. So we bottle it through, the, through this uh, bottling. Uh, it's not complicated. You know, you can spend a lot of money and get fancy stuff that does it all for you. But we bottle two bottles at a time, and then we put lids on them. And, uh, then we take the bottles, once they're full, put them on a, this labeler, and it's just, you know, one turn kind of put the label on. And um, then we box them in, in these boxes and then we ship them out to the people who order online or some local folks who do the work. We'll look at the label on the box then. Okay. So are you, are you interested in selling this stuff? If somebody that sees this video oh, sure. sees it? Yeah. Okay, so they we'll... They can come out here. They can go to some of the places that, that retail the oil for us in town. Or they can um, order online. Okay. So we do a few different size bottles. This is... It's all in... It's all in liters or milliliters. But this is a, a, a 375 milliliter bottle. My wife designed the the... The uh, label is Terra Dolce Farms, which means sweet earth. I was just kind of playing on the Vidalia onion sweet uh, area. Um, okay, now how would they get in touch with you? Well, they can go online or they can call, they can call me. And I'm, I forgot about that. We've got the internet now. Yeah, I always, it's not like the old days. Yeah. You just type in your name? Yeah, or Terra Dolce Farms and it comes up. All right. Uh, we've got a website that's... Uh, Terradolce Farms at gmail.com or they can um, you know they can come out and we also do farm tours if you want to bring a church group or a, a garden club we just had the garden club from Jessup the, or from Odom the other day um, but we do we do quite a bit of that so all right well uh, I'd like to see that that uh, dual that package that had okay. the vinegar and okay. the this go. We also do some flavored oil. This is rosemary, lemon, basil, and garlic. And we do 100 milliliters. You're going to do gift packs or something like that. Mm -hmm. We also do that in flavors. But one of, the, one of our best sellers is a, is a balsamic. It's, balsamic is good balsamic. It's actually made from a muskrate in uh, central to northern Italy. And this balsamic is aged for 18 years. Wow. You know, sometimes you get a real liquidy vinegar, it's kind of really tart. Uh, this is more sweet than tart. Um, but that really, everybody that tastes that loves it. And you have a little gift package yeah, these, type thing, don't you? Yeah, we do two gift, we actually do three. This is a, a two pack of uh, balsamic and vinegar and balsamic vinegar and olive oil. That's a 375 pack. Um, this is 250 milliliters, a small pack of the same way. And then we do a, a smaller pack of two flavored oils in one of our, just our extra virgin oil. So I can yeah. see somebody wanting to give this as a oh, this is great Christmas gift. present or a, or a That's where birthday most, gift. most of our sales are at Christmas, but these mm -hmm. are are great gifts. I mean, when you can spend $25 and give somebody something kind of unique to Georgia, unique to Toombs County, um, you know, it means something. Um, could we look at the you olive spend trees? You spend $25 going to, to McDonald's. Exactly. <laughs> so these trees are about 15 years old. Um, they're 
They're a variety called Arbicana. It's a Spanish variety. We have two other varieties here. We actually have three or four other varieties, but not in large quantities. But I'm planting some new varieties now from southern Spain, uh, southern uh, France, in an attempt to find some different taste profiles, as well as olives that may produce more tons to the acre, which we need to do. Olives are a little bit like pecan trees. They alternate. One year you have a good crop, the next year not so good. I'm trying to find some varieties that are more consistent. Um, it's part of being the guinea pig in a new industry like this. But uh, So we're, we're planting those new varieties this year, and it'll take three years before they actually produce any uh, olives. These little little BB looking things are the, uh, the potential olives. The buds turn into the flowers and the flowers then release the pollen and, the, and uh, a percentage of that pollen actually makes, makes the olive. And that's, this is the early, early stages of that. And so the anticipation is always, am I gonna get a good fruit set or not? You know, and that's the that's where you know you're going to make any money that year or not. There's one thing I want you to explain about the berm and why you don't think that it's necessary. Okay. Because some people are planting olive trees in their yards. And on the YouTube uh, uh, online, they're saying you got to make a mound and all. And I think you might know something yeah. about that. So these were, I was, I've been in the pine tree pine straw business forever so I had a better uh, that had a, a ripper that would uh, subsoil the land and that so I used that because it was available to me but it's not necessarily the way you plant olives you can plant them on flat dirt and um, you still need to subsoil to so you can roots go down quickly and the soil's loose and, and malleable but um, so some people are saying you need to, the olives don't like wet feet, and that's why they want to put them on a hill. But well, uh, if you've got if you've got land that is that's overly wet, you may want to consider that. Don't plant them there. Uh, the the interesting thing about wet soil is olive trees that are growing in really wet soil make olives every year. <laughs> There's, and I just learned from, from a guy in Texas, now they won't make a big tree. It's, it sort of stunts the tree and I can show you this. But I, I found out this year, something I should have known all this time, is that when that olive is starting to bud, you need to keep that dirt as wet as possible. All the way through the flowering, only the bad thing about the flowering is you don't want a lot of rain, so you got to artificially irrigate it. But in Georgia, one of <laughs> we can't control uh, the rain in Georgia, and sometimes we get a lot of it at the wrong time. Sometimes we get uh, a lot at the right time. So it, you just have to bear with that. But um, but the tree, when in the fall, you really don't want a lot of rain because you actually want the water leaving the olive in, in the conversion to oil. So anyway, I'll show you some wet land because this land has a little bit of wet, dry, sandy, and You want to show us where some are growing in yeah, a wet sure. spot? Right. All right, go ahead, Tommy. So, the, you know, the thing we were told in the beginning is that olives don't grow, uh, they don't like wet feet or don't plant them in wet areas. This field, like a lot of fields, has a spot or two where it's really wet. It's because the water doesn't get, uh, there's some impermeable clay that doesn't let it move uh, out of the dirt. So there's place, these places like this, the trees don't grow big. But every year they make olives. Instead of the every other year like yeah, the they, other, the and, normal ones. And I think it's partly because during the period where the buds are, are coming out, they, they need a lot of water. And um, in fact, the experts from Texas or California will say you need to water them heavily during the budding period or during the flowering period. 
So um, that's what we're. So, so if I'm you, not, I'm not too worried about the the wet feet as long as it's just not standing water. So if you're getting some olive trees to plant in your yard or your garden, don't be afraid to plant it on flat ground. And uh, you don't have to do a mound. I imagine that dries out pretty quick too, doesn't it? That well, mound. This, I wouldn't say it's. If you've got if you got really wet dirt, you might want a mound. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, I can sh I can show you where I'm planting now. I mean, you go across the field, just about any field, you're gonna have some spots where it's drier than others. Right. It's just how the water leaches away from the soil. Some of it, if you got, if you only have clay, a, if you got clay a foot down, the water's going to stay there. If your clay's three foot down, you it's going to go through. It's going to go down. All right. Thank you, Tommy Williams. Yeah. And if you are anywhere in uh, South Georgia or anywhere in Georgia at all, or contact them at Terra Dolce. Dolce. Terra Dolce Farms. And he will like to schedule you for a tour for your church group or your school group and uh, show you what's going on. Thank you very much, Tommy. Thank you.